So, uh, yeah, I was trained as a physicist, and as Pierre just mentioned, uh, nowadays I teach and conduct research as a professor of applied physics at Stanford. But what brings me here today, actually, is kind of an extracurricular activity. Uh, I've been very interested in, in ceramics in recent years, uh, meaning pottery, and um, very recently I've been uh, putting a lot of thought into trying to imagine how to close the gap uh, between the ceramics activity that I so far have really just been doing for fun and the sorts of academic activities that I do in my day job uh, that I supposedly get paid for. And um, so that thinking is uh, going to come to your first test uh, next quarter, in the spring quarter of this academic year. I'll be teaching a course at Stanford, which will be an undergraduate applied physics course, which is actually a ceramics and physics course. And it's really sort of an attempt to maybe imagine how these two worlds really come together and what there is of value to try to add to the Stanford undergraduate curriculum uh, at coming at, at subjects from, from both of these two perspectives. So I'm going to get back to actually tell you about that course at the very end, and uh, between now and then, I want to kind of walk through uh, where I'm coming from in all of this uh, and, and quote some authorities to try to back up the ideas that I'll, I'll try to convince you of. So um, when it comes to ceramics, I'm really just an amateur, uh, but I have uh, started doing things like uh, submitting entries to juried exhibitions, uh, sending photos of my work in to try to get them in shows, and when you do that, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, you often need to submit a so-called uh, artist statement. Um, it strikes me that this is not completely different than what we do as scientists when we send a, a paper into a journal to try to get it published. You need to write a cover letter, and there you're supposed to try to explain where you're coming from and why you think this is important, etc. But, um, you know, since I'm, I'm not a professional artist and since I really hate writing cover letters for the papers that I, I send into journals, uh, I've uh, fallen into using an art, artist statement that's really kind of good. Um, you know, something that you can I think I believe in that as a, as a statement, as, as a personal statement, not just in terms of uh, creative artistic activity, but also in terms of the way that I like to do science. And so, you know, there, there's the real connector, I think, between the, sub, the, the subjects of ceramics and physics, and so, um, you know, that's where I want to try to grow in this talk. So the first step of all that is to try to explain to you what I mean about this kind of uh, searching and, and following clues and all of that. So let me just uh, walk you a little bit through some of my ceramics work to try to explain what I mean by all of that. Um, so I've mostly been interested in wood-fired ceramics. So this means that you're forming uh, vessels out of clay, and you don't glaze them. So they just go as bare clay into, a, I, I like to use a wood-fired kiln. And so any of the colors and surface appearances that you end up with on the pots, these are just things that happen kind of naturally and organically in the way that the clay material interacts with the uh, very violent chemical hot atmosphere inside of a wood kiln. Nevertheless, I think, you know, as a, as a maker of things, you like to somehow put some sort of personal expression onto the surfaces of your, of your pieces and not just in the form. And so at some point I was struggling to try to think, well, you know, what is my personal expression that I want to try to, to, to put onto these, these things that I'm making? You know, what are, and, and at some level, what do I really have to personally express uh, spending so much of my time thinking about things as boring as science? Um, and, Reflecting on it a little bit, what came to me was, well, you know, one thing that I do worry about quite a lot is when I think about the scientific work that I do, um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of thinking. I, I feel that I really put a lot of personal creative effort into it, but then what is the result? You know, what, what is the product of all of this scientific research? Very often, it's some set of equations that ends up in a journal article in some very obscure sort of journal, which a small set of people are interested in reading, but, you know, for, for most of... Uh, my peers and my community, they'll never really be able to understand what's in there, and they, they shouldn't really be interested anyway. And so that's kind of a sad state of affairs when you think about, okay, this is where I'm, I'm putting my life's work, what do I do with that? And then it occurred to me at some point, well, maybe, you know, the, the equations, which are in some sense a kind of a distillation of, of the thought that goes into doing the scientific research, at least you could try to resurrect those things as purely graphical markings and start writing them on the surfaces of, of ceramic pots. And so, you know, they don't really mean anything in that context, but, you know, they can be interesting visually. And maybe this is a way to kind of redeem all of this work, to put it back 
uh, in the eyes of people who are not my scientific colleagues and whether they can be uh, appreciated by a somewhat wider sort of audience. So, you know, the first uh, iterations of that are things like this, where on the left there's a porcelain vase and on the right a stoneware vase. On the left, this is just equations written in other glazed pencil. Uh, and on the right, these, uh, this is actually a slip inlay sort of technique. But these are equations just taken verbatim from the sorts of articles that I've uh, written in the past. And this is sort of the first step towards seeing how uh, you know, they can sort of uh, have this redemption in, in Second Life as just as, as graphics on the surface of, of pots. And um, you know, when I really felt like I was getting someplace was actually in the next iteration of a lot of this. So this is a similar sort of thing where, again, the equations are written in the Everglades uh, pencil. But here, um, these pots were fired in a way that um, you know, when you put pots into a wood kiln, there's a lot of fly ash that's floating around in the kiln. So you're burning wood, it's throwing ash. A lot of the ash will actually land on the pots, and so you can see the sort of modeled appearance on these. You know, again, this was just bare clay with the writing on it to start with. The ash falls on the kind of on, on the shoulders of the pots, and the temperature is so high that the ash actually melts. And wood ash actually has a lot of silica in it. You know, it's 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 actually kind of like glass. So the ash will melt and then start to run down the sides of the pots. And so, like here, for instance. You can see an ash uh, drip that, that melted and kind of ran through the equation and sort of dragged it, you know, dragged it down with it. And you know, it's it, it's fun to think of this as sort of uh, you know nature and natural processes sort of reasserting their primacy over these abstract notions of mathematics and science. But you know, in seeing this come out of the kiln, this really struck me as something. It's a kind of thing that I feel like I need to pursue, and I don't actually quite know what I want to do with it next. But it really feels like the kind of thing that I want to follow up on. And so this is an example of one of these clues where, well, I've just been playing around and you try out some things and then you see what happens. And sometimes you just get this sense that, okay, this is a good direction to go in. I want to keep going in this way. And you know, I don't exactly know where I'm trying to get, but you know, it's the accumulation of these clues that somehow start to, to define your body of work. And there's some other things, like I realized very early on that you know, when you throw things on a wheel, uh, everything comes out round. <laughs> and after a while, you get a little bit sick of this and you start to ask yourself, how you can make your pots not round. Uh, so you go through a phase of just sort of squishing them and, and pounding on them with your hands, and it always looks very confusing. For I think, in a way, is, a, is uh, some process by which you can um, take away a bit of the symmetry that's there in the thrown pieces, but in a way that doesn't have an obvious intention to it, right? In some way that feels a little bit more natural and organic. And so I, I discovered early on that I really liked uh, kind of taking rope or cord Actually, for these pieces, I use candle wick. So you just can wrap them around the finished pieces, and if you tug on it in little ways, you know, you'll, you'll slightly distort the form of the piece and also leave these very nice markings in the surface of the clay. So I started, started kind of with that, wanted to do something a little bit more uh, dramatic, and ended up coming towards the ideas of um, actually using knots. Right? So knots, again, come back a little bit towards scientific ideas. As some of you may know, there's a whole mathematics of knots. Right? I mean, Knots uh, have the, all these uh, very elegant hidden, hidden symmetries to them. And so as forms, you know, they're not natural, but they are something which is not, you can say that, you know, humankind doesn't invent knots, they discover them, right? So I would uh, take the rope or candle wick and form uh, knots. There's actually, I found a very nice phone app that shows you how to tie knots from <laughs> rope climbing or sailing and that kind of thing. And so you, you just make the knots and then press them into the pots and you get both a deformation of the surface of the pot and also they leave these very nice markings in there, which survive and even get enhanced by the wood firing process. And so, you know, that, that's another sort of clue that I think I want to follow down. I, again, don't quite know where it's going, but you know, it's another thing I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to amplify. And then also this thing I mentioned about atmospheric firings, and you know, this is again another thing that engages the sort of uh, scientific interest together with the ceramics, that you know, looking at the spectrum of colors that you can get from wood firing, all of these pots just start out as sort of white-ish plain pots. And these colors ranging from the reds and oranges to sort of yellows, browns, grays, blues, uh, you know, these nice bronze, uh, whatever you want to call these colors, these are just things that happen from the way that the fire interacts with the clay. And so as a physicist, you, want, you become very interested in trying to understand how that all happens and what controls it. And so you think, you know, really trying to, you know, if you ask a traditional craft person, if you ask a potter where that comes from, they know what you have to do to get these effects. Uh, and, you know, they, they have some explanation for where they come from. So all of these blues and grays and blacks will be called carbon trapping. The reds and oranges are called flashing. But if you really ask, but on like a microphysical level, what is that? 
I don't think that anybody really knows. Um, but you know, certainly in this day and age, we do have the materials uh, science and analysis tools to try to figure that out. And so it seems like if you could really uh, understand all of that in a very quantitative way, maybe this would show you some directions for doing something really new uh, in the art of wood firing, which is uh, already by this point many thousands of years old. So, so it's interesting to ask what modern science has to say for that. You know, so, so those are my clues. And what I have tried to convey was, you know, it's not like I went into making things with this sort of, with, with these ideas preformed. You're just sort of in there working with the clay and you just ask yourself what you can do next to try to do something a little bit different. And you try a lot of stuff and it turns out really horrible, but you know, sometimes you try something and you, know, you recognize that something interesting is there. And so then the next step on your research is to really try to figure out how to take the next step with that and, and go even further in that direction. Now, as I said, though, as an artist, I'm really kind of a, as a ceramics person, I'm really kind of an amateur, so I don't really want you to take my word for it that this is representative of, of good creative process in art. So uh, let me turn to uh, one of my favorite ceramic artists, um, who was uh, Robert Turner. Uh, you can find a gallery of his uh, work online. And here I have an excerpt from uh, an article that he wrote in a journal called The Studio Potter. Uh, and let me just read this to you, because I think he, he says it much more eloquently than I can. Uh, Robert Turner says, the key lies in our perception, one can't make it happen. I can only provide an environment in which there are enough extraneous possibilities to assure that one of them will jump up. It's beyond what I could have done if I had planned it. Often, it is the seemingly disparate elements that make it happen. The best I can do is recognize some urge for a sense of place where these joinings will occur. That is the way that I work. There's no question that this refers to the intuitive process. When a piece works, it is the realization of experiences that you've been trying to get into the clay language. It's got to find its own way. You don't even know what you're looking for until it happens. Dot, dot, dot. I can only plan the gesture or the motion I have in mind with some structure as an environment in which it can occur. I mean, so I think if you're charitable, you can find echoes of what I've been trying to say in these words of Robert. <laughs> um, but you know, when I read this too, the thing that really struck me was you know, this idea that you don't intentionally go in and try to direct the creative or some working practices where experiments and kind of trial and error can take place. And your real job as the maker is not one of doing, but really of recognizing. So stuff happens and you have to sort of filter out the things that you think are really good. They really say something about where you're trying to go. And you grab those and you really try to pull them forward. And so the thing that really uh, resonated the most with me about that was actually not anything that I do in my personal work, but it's the work that I think that I do as a leader of a research group. So in this day and age, as a, as a physical scientist, it's very hard to actually get very much done working by yourself, especially if you're teaching and writing grants and doing all that sort of thing at the same time. <coughs> so it tends to be that you uh, have to build and hire a, a team of researchers, typically PhD students and postdoctoral students, who are actually doing that research work. And your main job as a, as a professor, as a faculty member, is to uh, kind of advise and mentor and, and kind of help that work along. And I've definitely had the attitude all along that, well, what I want to do is I'm not going to micromanage what my students and postdocs do. Rather, I want to encourage them to develop and follow their own interests and sort of do projects that they think are interesting. But what my job is that as they're kind of fumbling around and trying to figure out something to do, when I see that something good is happening, I encourage them to do that. If I see that two different people in the group are working on seemingly different things that may really complement each other very well, I try to get them working together. And so I really see, I really appreciate that idea of a working environment where, well, the idea of an environment, that really what you're trying to do is create the right kind of context in which random stuff can bubble up, and you know, the job of the, of the maker is really to, to select and, and, and kind of encourage uh, the best parts of that work. So you know, all of these things I think really come together, like this whole idea of searching and finding clues and following them. Uh, you know, I think it also, I, I look back and I see that it's very much the way that my scientific careers come together. Uh, I mentioned something in my abstract about, in title about applied science. Um, but you know, if I look back on the history of what I've been interested in doing, uh, you know, it's really something where, you know, I had things that I got interested in for who knows what reason back in graduate school. You know, a few different themes in, in quantum optics and quantum engineering. And I can see as I look back that, yeah, I've been sort of following those and trying to see where they go. Uh, papers have been written along the way. And you know, somehow, a few different kind of 
you know, seemingly unrelated things have come together in the work that my group is doing now, which I kind of think of as our, our mature scientific work, which actually is something which I hope will be impactful in the, in the field of, uh, of information science and, and, and engineering. But it's really definitely not a sort of directed research program where I knew at the beginning where I wanted things to go. It was really just this thing of sort of uh, following impulses and just sort of uh, seeing what would happen but then opportunistically uh, trying to relate that to problems that I, I, I uh, understand are important problems uh, for technology and for industry. And so again, to try to appeal to an artistic authority, let me read a quote from another artist I admire very much, uh, William Kentridge, a uh, visual artist. Um, he has a, a book that just came out called Six Drawing Lessons, which I think are uh, edited transcripts of lectures that he gave at Harvard. Uh, so William Kentridge says, to locate where we are, we are in the studio, trying to parse the specific nature and activity of the studio, which can be characterized as making a safe space for stupidity. <laughs> this necessary stupidity is not the same as foolishness, or the innocence of the pure fool made wise through compassion. It is not the fool with license to speak truth to power. It is not a simple naivete elevated. Rather, it is making a space for uncertainty, for giving an impulse, an object, a material, the benefit of the doubt. Following the impulses that feel stupid, without a destination, believing that at some point, we will emerge from our zoetrope. It is more than this. It is a conscious repression of evaluating in advance of the action the value of the thought, allowing the work and the walk with its nonsense repeated mantras and words to take their time, to allow that which starts as a whim to continue. And so, you know, I, I find some reinforcement for this idea of the studio as a safe place or for research as sort of trying to create a safe space for exploration, uh, for following the impulse and the whim, but then, uh, you know, if you take all of this seriously, you know, if, I, if I would really want to try to advocate that, well, I, you know, I believe that this kind of attitude, oops, that this kind of attitude towards creativity is really something important for uh, for young scientists and engineers. Maybe this is a kind of process. It takes a really long time, I think, to develop that sense of editing, right, of knowing how to recognize what's a promising idea or when you've made progress and when you haven't. And so, you know, I think you want to teach students, science students, this kind of process, but I think that you actually have to do this, at, at, at least at the early stages, outside of the context of scientific research itself. And so that's this idea that I'm trying to get at with this uh, physics and ceramics sort of course. Um, the course is going to be called The Questions of Clay. Uh, I think it's got a subtitle, something like um, cre uh, Craft, Creativity, and Scientific Process. And, and so the idea is that students will be, each student in the class will be responsible for creating an individual portfolio of creative work, that is, they're going to make pots. Uh, we're going to fire them in a kiln that I built over at Stanford. And uh, so the, individual stu the students have these individual portfolios of creative work, but then as a class, we're going to learn to use modern scientific instrumentation to study what's going on in color and surface development in these sorts of fine ceramics, uh, and also to study to try to study some of the processes that are actually happening in these uh, in this in the hot atmosphere of this uh, of this uh, reduction kiln. And so, can you say we'll, something about the temperature? How? Yeah. So the temperature range. By the time you're finished, you're usually at something like 2,300 or 2,400 Fahrenheit. And um, in a wood-fired kiln, you're doing that just by burning wood. Uh, so in the atmosphere, you have a lot of calcium, <coughs> sodium, potassium, things like that, a little bit of iron. Uh, the kiln that we have at Stanford is a gas-fired kiln, so it's fired using propane, but it's made in a way that follows a, a prototype developed by a friend of mine named Steve Davis, uh, where you can blow in wood ash at the end of the firing. And so for the last hour or a couple of hours, you can reproduce that uh, wood-type atmosphere when you're at these highest temperatures of 2300, 2400 degrees. Uh, and so the way that the syllabus was put together, this is actually a course that students at Stanford can take either to satisfy their creative expression uh, undergraduate requirement, so they can kind of do their arts requirement using this class, or they can satisfy what's called a scientific method and analysis requirement. So they can also sort of get the part of their experimental science uh, requirement uh, through this class. 
And you know, we, I've had a little bit of experience in working with the undergraduates in very compressed time frames of uh, learning about ceramics and making work. And let me just say that it's really truly impressive the kind of creativity that Stanford students will come up with uh, if you just sit them down in front of a piece of clay. And so you know, the sorts of tools that we have are things that are, of course, purchased for fancy engineering kinds of applications, <coughs> electron microscopes, uh, you know, you know, focus ion beam kinds of tools. But all of these things can be very useful for trying to understand uh, what's going on um, in the chemistry <coughs> of the surface that, surfaces that you get in these sorts of wood fire processes. And then also a lot of chemical analysis having to do with what's going on with the iron in the clay, which is, I think, the key to what's happening with most of the color. Uh, there are lot, likewise lots of material science tools that we can use to, to do this kind of thing. And so these are, these are the sort of lab sections that we're going to have uh, in the class that will run in parallel to some lectures and discussion sections and actual studio work of, of, of students working with the clay. You know, so the hope is that through this kind of a process, uh, we'll be able to have the students learn a little bit uh, about the, you know, this idea of creative exploration. Um, the class will hopefully emphasize to them that they don't need to think about uh, artistic work and scientific work as being completely separate things, but to try to see uh, all of this put together <coughs> in a single context, where the focus at the end of the day is on clay, it's on, it's on making pots that we like. But you know, there are the creative aspects and there are the technical uh, sort of method related aspects. And I'm just hoping that the students will come out of it sort of having a new appreciation for how those things go together and being convinced that investing some time in, in really developing their artistic facilities is something that can really help them in the future, even if what they want to do professionally is be a scientist or an engineer. <coughs>